Grateful to introduce Jill. I've known Jill for, I think, about 30 years. And there's a little bit of a bio on the website, so I won't go and repeat that. But I'll share with you the kind of the context of Jill and the environment that I'm most familiar with, and that is sales trainers and sales leaders. And we've heard Tom Winninger, and we've heard Mike McKinley, and, and now this is the Triple Crown. We have Jill Conrath. And as you look at her career, She's a, a top performer when it comes to any sales role. She's really a big deal. I mean, if you're in sales and you don't know Jill Conrath, you're not in sales very long because you will learn about who Jill Conrath is. And I'm really grateful to, uh, to call her a friend. I think we're going to be learning a very inspirational message, just like we heard from Tom Winninger and Mike McKinley. And those were some of our big meetings. And, and Bob Belanga, the only reason I didn't include you in that is because you're not concentrating on sales, you're concentrating on other areas. So uh, you're, you're a big deal also, but not in the category of being a sales trainer. So that's why I didn't include you. So I'm grateful that Jill agreed to be with us and to share with us the message that is really gonna be able to, I think, change our attitude, transform us to not look at things as, as dire, but to really feel better and to, to have some optimism and some hope. And I think you're going to hear that in her message. So I'm really grateful that Jill agreed to be with us. So thanks, Jill. The floor is yours. Can you hear me now? Yes. There you go. Thanks. Thank heavens. <laughs> Technical <laughs> skills are not my strength. <laughs> so thanks for the introduction, Scott. And yes, we've known each other for a really long time. And I am delighted to be here with you guys today to um, talk about things. Now, Scott introduced me as somebody who's like, you know, a big deal in sales and I have spent my entire career just about in the sales field. So I want you to know that I'm not going to be talking about all the stuff I usually talk about, all the how to do things in sales because that's not really what y'all want to hear. I don't think. I think we want to take a look at something bigger and broader. And so what I'll be talking about today is what I've learned in my career in sales and how that actually applies to, to um, I think, all of our lives right now, certainly to my life, um, and, and just share my stories in terms of where I've been and where, I, where I've gone through, what I've learned, and where I'm going to. So it's not just a lifetime history. It's, it's really actually looking back to see where, to see, you know, where I've come from, but also what's possible in the future. So what I want to start out with initially is just saying to all of you that I um, am probably the original Roseville optimist. And I moved into Roseville at the age of nine. And my folks moved from, the, from Minneapolis. They moved to Roseville because they wanted to get into one of the best school districts in the state. And that was the reason that I got into the Roseville school system. But my biggest memory of being nine years old is not the move to Roseville, it's the movie that was um, most popular that year. It came out that year, I fell in love with it and became a disciple of the methodology of the movie. And the movie was, and you guys will laugh, Pollyanna. And so, some of you may remember Pollyanna, the story of a young girl who was orphaned and uh, her father had taught her how to play the glad game. So she came to live with her aunt, who was a mean spinster aunt who had no tolerance for children. And she started playing the glad game around in this environment. And the glad game is really taking a look at everything that's bad that's happening to you and finding something good in it. Now, some people can say that that's blind optimism. Um, you know, living with rose colored, colored glasses. But for me, there was something in that that I had really never experienced before, which was the ability to take something and shift my mind to something else. It was a fascinating thing to say, oh, here's the situation I'm in. Is there another way to look at it? Is there another way to look at it? And I had never thought that I could do that kind of thing in my life and find another way to see the same situation. I mean, I thought something was terrible happening, but was there another perspective? And so realistically, that, that became a foundation of my life at the age of nine. I'll give you a quick example. In high school, this is really silly, but in high school, I had been a junior varsity cheerleader and they had tryouts for varsity cheerleading. And um, before the tryouts, there were 60 of us who were trying out for varsity cheerleading. Before the tryouts, 
they sent out a letter to all of our teachers asking if there was anybody that they didn't think should be a cheerleader for any reason at all. And out of the 60 girls that were trying out, there were only two who were not allowed to, one gal with a D average and me with an A average. And I was a really good kid and I didn't do anything bad in school. And when I went to find out what it was, they said I talked too much in class. And so I wasn't allowed to try out for cheerleading. And if that's your whole identity as a young person growing up, it was catastrophic. I spent three days sobbing in my bedroom, trying to figure out what my life was going to be like if I couldn't be a cheerleader. But then on the third day, <laughs> I feel like I rose again from the dead. I mean, I kind of feel like saying that right now. But um, on the third day, I said, okay, that's enough feeling sorry for yourself and looking at this as the bad side. What does this have to do? You know, what's, what's good that can come out of it? And I played the glad game. And I said, well, Jill, now that you're not doing all that stuff over here with cheerleading, that frees up all this time for you to do something else interesting in your life. And so then I got a chance to stop and ask myself what was interesting. And I said, well, you know, I used to play the viola and the orchestra, and I haven't played that for four years since so I went to the orchestra conductor. And he said, sure, yeah, you have to take a year of lessons. You can play in the orchestra your senior year. That year in orchestra, I have to tell you, I was the worst person in orchestra, the worst, in the farthest chair back. And I could barely keep up with these kids who've been playing for their whole for their whole lifetime, but I enjoyed it tremendously. And it was the first time I let go of having to try to compete and do something good. It was just, I could do something for the pure enjoyment of doing it. And the other thing that I found out from the other activity I joined was yearbook. And by my senior year, I was the section editor of the yearbook. And I was given 25 blank pages to work with. 25 blank pages pages that I got to create myself. And if I have to look at my high school years, 25 blank pages was the most exciting part of those years. And, and, you know, as Scott mentioned, I've been in sales and I've, since that time, I've written four books on sales, one, one book on, on um, how to get a job in a bad economy. And, and I've written tons and dozens and hundreds of blog posts and, and, and done things like that. Blank pages, thrilled me, but I wouldn't have found it had I not found the good thing and the bad thing that happened to me. So that's kind of the basis why I say that I probably am the original Roseville optimist. It was a deliberate choice on my part when I was nine years old, and I have practiced optimism since that time. Now, the girl from Roseville, who was kind of a quiet nerd, um, actually went to the University of Minnesota and became a teacher, hated it from day one. I did it because it was a good job for a woman at that time, and um, it was the wrong job for me. And so one of the things that happened to me after a few years is I decided I wanted to find another job, and it was really difficult to find a job if you were a home economics teacher. <laughs> Nobody wanted to hire somebody who could cook and sew really well. So after a while, I... Um, decided I was going to have to create my own job. And so I, set, I spent about a year studying what was available in the marketplace. And I discovered a gap in the market, roped some friends in, and we went to talk to the Service Corps of Retired Executives. SCORE, government agency, still out there. Great organization. And the guy looked at this plan and he said, whoa, this is good. It's timely. You guys are absolutely the right people to do this. And then he looked at us and he said, now, which one of you three is going to be doing sales? And I leaned forward and I said, because I hated sales. I said, I thought you said this was a good idea. And he said, it is Jill, but somebody has to sell it. And I was sick to my stomach. And I said, we are going to have to talk about it. So what I'm telling you is I ended up in sales, not because I wanted to be a salesperson, but because I had an idea that I wanted to pursue. And I was in service to the idea that I actually got myself a job in sales. And I, and I'm, I really want to mention it in service to the idea. I did not want to do it, but it was something I felt I had to do in order to do something I felt was more important. And I was willing to take that step to, to, you know, to achieve my goals. Now, again, you might think that, that once I got into sales that I, you know, loved it and I wanted to stay in sales all my life. I, I found it interesting and challenging and, 
and I, and I did stay in sales my whole life, but it wasn't the plan, nor was it my plan to write books, nor was it my plan to, to actually leave the sales field and go into consulting on sales. No, nor was it my plan to do a whole lot of things in life, but here I am at the end of, at the end of my career. And I'm going, wow, what just happened? How did I get from here to there? And I know that a lot of people talk about the importance of goal setting, but I think that there is an importance of moving forward and making decisions in service of what you believe is important. And so what I want to talk about is some things that I learned along this journey that I think are important, um, not just in sales, but as something I did learn in sales or mastered in sales, but also in terms of, you know, like I said, going forward and what we are going to be doing for the rest of our lives, because we've all got a rest of our lives in front of us. But the first thing I want, really want to stress, something I learned in high school, learned completely when I was in, in sales and then am focused on as a business owner myself too. But the one thing that I learned real early on was the power of questions. And I, I really think that, you know, knowledge is, is important, but I think if you really want to work with people, the ability to ask good questions is one of the most significant things that you can do. And my first experience with learning the power of questions occurred when I was 16 years old. And I, again, at Kellogg High School in Roseville, Minnesota, and I wanted to go out on dates and have people, have guys like me. And so I read diligently, I read Seventeen Magazine. And what I discovered in Seventeen Magazine is the secret to getting guys to like you. And it, now remember, I didn't, I didn't want to just be asked out for one date. I wanted to be asked out for a second date. Because if you only got asked out for one date, you were a failure on your first date. So anyway, I read this article completely and it said the key to success and getting a guy to date you is to ask him questions and to get him talking. So I'll tell you, I went out with Don and that was the first time I, I did that. I went out with Don and I Thought, okay, Don, he's in, he's on soccer, he plays in the band, and I took a few other things that he was in, and I wrote out my list of 10 questions to ask Don on the date, related to what I learned about his past history and what he was involved with. And we went on the date, and I had the questions in my purse, so that if at any moment, if at any moment I got stuck, I could I could, you know, find the answers. And I remember being at McDonald's on Snelling Avenue and running out of questions to ask. And I remember saying, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go to the bathroom for a second. And I went to the restroom and I quickly opened my little purse, pulled out my questions. I went back, sat down with Don and continued the conversation. Okay, so at the end of that date, Don said to me, Wow, this has been really fun. We have so much in common. And I remember looking at him going, you don't know anything about me. You've talked this whole evening. And he said, would you like to go out again? And I said, yes. And I went, bingo. This is like in incredible. I didn't have to go out there and talk the whole time. I, I just got to ask him questions. The pressure it took off me was incredible. And it allowed me to relate to him and learn so much about him. It was phenomenal. And then I went, you know, boom, boom, boom. I, I moved into teaching and I found out the questions were essential and working with students and getting them engaged in the classroom and, and being part of the conversation. And if you could do that, they wanted to learn more. And then when you take that and you move it to the next phase, I went to Xerox, which is the company who hired me after I decided it was time to get a job in sales. And Xerox's training program was based on research by Neil Rackham, who had studied 10,000 sales calls or 10,000, I think, at least 10,000 sales calls or maybe 30,000 calls with 10,000 salespeople. And his key differentiator between the top salespeople and the average salespeople was their ability to ask good questions. Not how big is your company, but questions in terms of like, what are your biggest priorities or what, what are your issues and challenges and where are you trying to head and what is in, you know, getting in the way? And so I learned then that questions were crucial. And, and to me, I've practiced the, the power of questions for decades. 
as a small business owner, because I have ultimately started my own consulting practice in, um, there was a point in time when my business was kind of taking off from a speaking perspective, but I didn't like doing all the speaking. So I wanted to do more work at home. And, but I also, I had come across something on the internet that said that free was the future. Free was the future. And I'm going, oh, how can I give away my expertise for free and make good money doing it? I mean, it was easy to give it away, but I still had to earn a living. So I asked a question that had no logical answer. How can I give away my expertise for free and make good money doing that? And I didn't go out and dig in. I, I just became open to what was possible and, and opened myself up to what might I be able to do. And believe it or not, within a few months, some people came to me and they'd ask me if I would do something and they'd pay me for it to do this webinar or to write an ebook. And they pay me for it and they were going to give it away for free to people out there in the greater world. And so I discovered a whole way to get out there and give away my expertise for free and still earn a good living. Now I'm saying that because for me, the questions evolved. I mean, I saw initially how the questions um, connected you with somebody. I saw when I was a teacher, how the questions engaged people. I saw when I was in sales that they, they helped people achieve what they were um, trying to achieve. And then I saw with my own business too, the power of questions and creating ideas and uh, future scenarios that you don't even know are possible when you start that. So for me, that's the, the number one thing that I learned early on that was essential in me being successful. And by the way, is part of who I am today. And, and when I look forward, I'll explain some more in terms of what I'm trying to do from that perspective. The second thing I learned was the necessity of reframing things. And when I re say reframing, and I'm saying taking a look at something in a different perspective. And, you know, again, it's kind of Pollyanna-ish in terms of, you know, find the, the bad and the good, but it, it's more than that. It's taking a, a look at what you're dealing with in life and seeing it from a different, a whole different perspective. When I first went into sales, um, one of the things that I was scared to death of was failure. And I think most of us are really scared of failing and especially failing publicly and in sales, in sales, if you fail, everybody knows it because they have these rankings of how people are doing. If you're in marketing or if you're in HR, nobody sees how you're doing every day. But in sales, it's like they put these numbers up and you know everybody sees how you're doing. It's awful. Um, so I was terrified of failing. I'd walked away from my teaching job, you know, scared to death, but I was committed to doing that. So one of the first things I learned how to reframe was um, was failure. I, I, I eliminated the word failure from my vocabulary because it was awful. It was awful. And I instead substituted, and this is the reframe, that I had just had a valuable learning experience, a valuable learning experience. To me, it was profound to make that switch. There was one point early on in my sales career when I, um, I made a call on, on a company that was in the 280, off a of 280 area, and I had made a call on the company. I was working with a lady named Tinsey about their copier decision, and she told me she was making the decision. And um, over the weekend, I read a book about selling to the top dog in a company, and I went, oh my God, Tinsey is the uh, secretary to the president. She's clearly not making the decision. Uh, I, I need to call the president. So on Monday, I called the president, lined up a meeting with the president, and I went to see him on Wednesday. And, and guess who met me in the lobby? Tinsey, the, the secretary. And she said, Jill, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm here to meet with Mr. Big. And she said, I told you I was making the decision. And there I am in the lobby with a lot of other people waiting there. And she gets right in my face. And she yelled at me worse than my mother had ever yelled at me in my life. And she was swearing at me. And I fainted dead away on the floor. I mean, boom, on the floor. And after a few minutes, I after I had a few minutes, a few seconds, I came to and she said, are you okay? And she helped me and a few other people helped me into a chair. And, and I said, I'm okay. And she said, well, then I suggest you leave and never come back. It's like, whoa. And I just got up and I walked out of that company just like that and uh, got out in the car and started sobbing. This was my new career. I had clearly 
failed at it big time and I needed to do something differently. And so I finally, I remember saying to myself, okay, Jill, that was a valuable learning opportunity. <laughs> what did you learn? And, I, and it took me a while to figure out what I learned. I went back to the office and I talked with people about what had happened. And I learned that you never go around people. If you want to get consensus and buy-in and whatever you're doing, you have to engage people. You can't just avoid people and go around them. But I learned it. And so every single time that I ran into something, I actually had to reframe it into a valuable learning experience. Um, another word that I added to, you know, reframing is um, I would say to myself, you're not a failure, Jill. You just haven't learned it yet. And the word yet was so crucial because it allowed me permission to stay in a learner mode and to go forward, to dig in, to figure out what needed to be done. Um, Fast forward a few years and, and, you know, the necessary of reframing. There was a period of time around 2000 when I lost all my business. 3M Animation were big companies around here, were my two biggest clients. I was booked out full, fully for five months in front of me. And I had all my work, you know, I had all this work. And well, that was uh, Wall Street said to both companies, thou shalt deliver, deliver better earnings. And the first thing they did at that point was they chopped all consultants. And so literally my entire career was wiped out in front of me and they said, we'll be back, we'll be back. And they didn't come back. And, and, and so I wallowed in self-pity for a while because I, I don't think the glad game is, is automatic. I think sometimes it takes you a while to play the glad game and see the good part of it. But um, what, it, what ultimately did, it forced me to rethink my business. Um, when you're, by the way, when you're a sales consultant and you don't have any clients, it doesn't look really good. You know, sales consultants should be brimming with clients. But no, I was a total failure from the whole universe. But here's what happened. When I finally admitted it to other people that I was really struggling with this issue, what happened was that everybody told me that they were having problems too. And whoa, it's not just me. I'm not the one who's lost my mojo. I'm not over the hill yet. <laughs> I still have some good years in front of me. This, is a, this isn't a problem. This is a challenge. And so another huge reframe for me was taking the word problem and turning it into a challenge. And by the way, there is significant re neuroscience brain research that shows if you think of something as a problem, it sucks all the energy out of you. Your brain can't come up with good ideas. It only looks at what you've done before. You're, you're less able to solve it and you're, you're sicker and everything is wrong. But when you say it's a challenge, your brain rises to the occasion and says, okay, how can I figure this out? What's out there? Who else knows something? And that's really um, an important thing. Uh, so to me, learning how to reframe was crucial. And I'll just tell you one more personal reframe in the last three years. Um, I lost, like, like um, the gal who joined us from Ecuador, I lost uh, three important people in my life within a, with a short period of time, including my husband, and decided to sell my house in White Bear Lake, which I'd lived in for over 40 years, and to move to downtown Minneapolis. And I decided to do that because I needed to change things up. And I knew that. And the first thing after my husband died is, again, feeling like a widow is a horrible thing to feel like, you know, to have to check boxes that you are a check widow, depressing, depressing, suck me down into depression every single time I had to check it. So I decided that I would reframe it and I would be single again, because I knew how to be single. And it didn't make me feel depressed. So I started checking single. And then when I decided to sell my house, my kids were really worried. What if you don't like it downtown? Maybe you should rent. And I said, no, no, I am going on Jill's urban adventure. And it's an adventure and it may not work out, but that's the joy of an adventure. You try it out, you learn from it, you go forward, you see what it's about. And it, it, it's okay if things don't work out because that's part of the adventure. And so I literally have a sign, I'll put it up, that I got. That life is an adventure. Go live it. And I put that up and stared at it every day for three years. Till it, I mean, it's in me that I am on an adventure. And I've got a new adventure coming. But to me, reframing was absolutely critical to do that. 
A um, couple other things that I think were really important that I learned in the journey was the um, critical need for perspective taking. And that's the ability to see things from other people's shoes. Now, um, when you're in sales, it's essential to be able to see things from your customer's perspective. Because if you just go in going, I got to tell you all about what I'm doing, what I'm selling, what I think is great, blah, 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 they hate you. And they put up their barriers and push back from you like that. But if you can understand that you're dealing with the vice president of sales, or you're dealing with the head of marketing, or you're dealing with an IT person, they each have different goals and, and challenges and, and um they're aiming for something and, and if you can, you know, focus on what matters to them and even understand their company and the environment in their company and who they are as a human being, you're much better able to serve their needs. It kind of goes back to the questions, you know, really getting into the person and who they are and what matters to that person. It's the same thing in your work environment. And if you have colleagues to really understand what your colleagues care about, because if you want to get buy-in and you want to get people to move in a direction or you've got an idea that's new and unique, I mean, what is it going to take for you to, to help them understand the value that they would get from implementing this new idea? Um, and it even has to do with family and friends. I, just last weekend, I had another lesson in getting into um, somebody's head and really understanding and taking their perspective. I, it was actually two weekends ago. I had scheduled a family weekend at the cabin up in northern Minnesota, Cross Lake, if any of you know where that is. And I had scheduled a family weekend with my daughter, um, my son and his wife and baby and me. And we were going to be up there together. And my daughter had a fit. She just, she invite, she said, no, I, I want to bring my boyfriend. Now her boyfriend is only her boyfriend for a few months, you know, and it just kind of made me uncomfortable bringing the boyfriend into the family unit after, I mean, it was just like, this is our family getting together. But she said, mom, you don't understand. You know, when you're with Ryan and Cynthia, I mean, everything focuses on the baby and, and they go out and they do things and, you know, you can stay and take care of the baby, but what about me? <laughs> You know, I don't have anybody here to play with. And I went, you know what? She's right. She's absolutely right. And I, I had to alter my stance last weekend because I, I really understood what she was actually saying to me. So those are some of the things that I have really focused on in my life. And, and I think, you know, kind of to, to pull it together, a, a couple of the things that I think are really important and that sales taught me and life has taught me is to focus on what's possible. I mean, I always, I always love looking at what, what we can do versus what we have to do. And, and I think right now that's more important than ever before. And I'll explain why I think that's so important. But, you know, when I was in sales, there was always a gap between where people, here's where we are today and here's where we could be, here's what's possible. And they didn't understand that. And if I could help them understand what was possible, then we could move forward much more quickly. And so that's, that's you know, the other fourth thing that I want to say and the, fi the one final thing that I really want to add in before I tell you where I'm going and what I'm doing is, is the need to step into what I call gulp moments. I mean, I have stepped into more gulp moments in my life, the kind of thing where you go, oh God, what have I done? What have I done? I can't believe I'm doing this. Um, and, I, and I think to myself, why have I taken these chances? When I left teaching to go into sales, not having a clue if I could be successful in knowing, first of all, that I didn't like it. I hated the profession, but I was willing to do it. People at Hudson High School in Hudson, Wisconsin, which is where I taught, they literally said to me, perhaps you shouldn't quit. Maybe you should take a leave of absence. And I said, no, if I take a leave of absence, I will have something to fall back on. And I won't throw myself into this new thing that I'm doing. And they told me I was stupid to do that because I might fail and might need to come back to teaching. And I knew that if I had the back door that I might end up back there. And I really knew I needed to move on. So I went into sales, like I said earlier, in service of my business idea. I didn't go into it because I wanted to. When my business crashed, 
one of the things that came out of it was the fact that I had some time after figuring out what I wanted to do going forward to re get my business. I had just started going forward and I had ran into another real crisis in my life. Um, I was at a class reunion and on the way home from my class reunion, I had a little bit too much to drink. I got a DWI and I was thrown in jail. Spent two days in jail because they had to decide, um, because I hit a car and there was a slight injury and they had to decide how they were going to charge me. And finally they put me out on the street two nights later. And, and um, anyway, the net result of it was I, I did lose my license. It was, it was, you know, I lost my license, not just for three months, but because there was an injury, I lost it for a year. And so I said to myself at that point, okay, Jill, you've lost your license. It's really hard for you to visit your clients here in the Twin Cities. Um, what are you going to do? And I decided that that was the year that I was going to devote to writing my book. And so I took everything that I'd learned because I just got all my business back. And that was the year I decided to write my book. And, and by the way, the minute I decided to write my book, I'm, things started to change. I, I literally um, got an email from a, a guy that I had, had met from Milwaukee. I mean, he was in the same business I was. And he, at the bottom, he signed you know, Michael Nick. Uh, author of ROI for selling. And I, so I sent him back an email that said, Michael, um, congratulations on your book. I didn't know you'd written one. Um, just think it's wonderful. And he writes back, are you thinking about writing a book? And I said, well, actually, yes, I have a proposal. You know, I'm working on a proposal for one right now. So he, at that very moment, he emails his publisher and says, here's this woman, she's gonna be writing a book on selling to big companies. Um, I think you ought to talk with her. And so before the end of the conversation, they had sent back an email saying, yeah, I'd we'd like to talk. And at that point, I got on the phone and I contacted two other people, uh, two other uh, book publishers, and I said, I've got one company over here who's interested in me and I, you know, and they want to see my manuscript. Do you want to see it? And both of them couldn't resist because if another publisher was seeing their manuscript, they had to see it too. And, and literally I had a book deal within two months of, of losing my license and I shut down and I wrote for much of the year, which is really the start of what I did. So, I mean, you take a look at the DWA. I was the worst thing that ever happened to me. I mean, the most embarrassing, um, I felt awful and I was, you know, humiliated with it, but I turned it into something that was good. And I honestly believe that the universe wanted me to go in a different direction. And it was putting a stop to what I was doing, forcing me to take on the mission of being in sales and bringing what I know about sales to the world. And, and that led me to write other three other books from that point of view. So, um, so I do know that it's a galt moment. It's a galt moment to write a book. And, and as I was starting to write the book, one of the other things that I discovered was that if you want your book to sell, and by the way, I, I come from sales and I don't want to just write a book to write a book. I want a book to make it sell um, because it would impact people then. It said you had to be a speaker. And I, and I, at that moment in time, I went, oh my God, there's nothing in the world I hate more than speaking. And I thought I'd die. I mean, I could talk to a classroom, 30 people training. I could do that speaking. I thought I'd die. And so I joined the National Speakers Association and learned how to become a speaker. Not because I wanted to speak, but because I was in service of the message. I had things to share that I wanted people to know about. And then finally, the other thing that, that I think was really hard for me too, the, the, the gulp moment, is um, at one point in time, I remember in the early 2000s, before like 2004, 2005, I remember saying, why aren't there any women out there? Why are it only bald white guys who are talking about sales? Not, oh, sorry, Scott. Um, <laughs> but why is it only bald white guys who are talking about sales? Why, why aren't there women out there? I mean, 30% of the women, people in sales are women. And, and, I, and I, why don't they step up? And, and then one day I went, oh my God, that's, that's my job. I'm the one who's most upset about this. Why don't they step up? 
And so I literally had to stay, step up and claim a, and, and establish a position in, in my field where I was highly visible all the time and, and, and um, <laughs> making an impact. And I, and I ended up starting a group called Women Sales Pros. And now that group has a bunch of women in it. There are a lot of women speakers out there. And, 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 and my job in sales is now complete. And I, I think that's a weird thing to say, but at this point, I know that my job is complete and I've known it for a couple of years. So the question becomes, what does that mean? And, and do I want to retire? And the answer is like, no, I don't know how to retire. I have a ton of energy. I want to make a difference and keep going. And I want to take what I've learned, some of these things that I've learned, and I want to move it into another area. So here I am today. And I was, I've been thinking about this idea for quite a long time now. Um, it started out years ago, again, about 15 years ago, the idea started percolating in my brain about what was really bothering me with the world. And, you know, I, I think about things for a while and they kind of ruminate, but what I had noticed was that it was just about impossible for people to agree on things. It was like the, the families were being ripped apart, red state, blue state, Republican, Democrat, and everything was going like this. And my own family was challenged and we couldn't talk to each other anymore. And we had holidays explode into, into massive fights. Of, in, 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 even with the young people, I mean, pointing at their parents, it was like awful, awful. It's like, what in the world is happening to our country? We're from the United States of America. We've never had this kind of polarization before. And, I, and so I started thinking about what could be done. You know, the power, this polarization, what could be done? And, and I started experimenting with language. And I remember one day, um, one day I was talking, well, I'll tell you a couple of stories. One day I was down in Louisiana. I was down in Louisiana with my husband. My son was playing football down there. And after the football game, my husband and I went into um, a bar to have dinner and met some young college guys in the bar, really interesting, neat guys. First thing they asked us though was, what state are you from? I said, Minnesota. And they said, oh, red state or blue state? I went, boo. That's wild. And I said, well, Minnesota's kind of an odd duck state. You know, we, we have a, a Republican governor and we've got, you know, we've got half and half sort of, and it changes back and forth. And that wasn't enough for them. And they said, then they said to me, what, where do you get your news? Where do you get your news? And I said, well, I know this sounds kind of weird, but I like to understand what, what's going on. And so like, I, I you know, I'll watch CNN and I'll watch Fox News and I'll watch MSNBC and I kind of check them all out to see what they're all saying about the world. And then they actually stopped talking to me because I wasn't like them. And it was like really, really weird. And then I came home and again, I'm thinking, this is not right. This is not right. I was ruled out of a conversation because I'm from Minnesota, which wasn't the same state. And so I started experimenting with language and was talking to a neighbor one day and said to her, we were talking about a somewhat controversial subject and her views I knew were very different than mine. And I said to her, you know, Mary, I am just one of those millions of people in the middle who believes X. I don't remember what the topic was. I'm just one of those millions in the middle who believes X. And she said, so am I. So am I. And I went, whoa, that is fascinating because if you took a look on the spectrum, I mean, there certainly is outward bound people on each side, but you know, there's the middle, but she was over here in the middle and I was over here in the middle and we just came to the center together and we could talk about what we could maybe do. And so at that point in time, I, I, I got a website called Millions in the Middle and I thought, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I bought the domain name in case I ever needed it. And it's been on my mind ever since. And I take a look at everything that's going on in this country and how it's being pulled apart and pulled apart. And I take a look at news and, and how con controversial, I mean, I just today, okay, just today before I got on, I took a look at different channels, or not channels on news on my cell phone. And here's the words I see used, slams, 
rips, blasts, attacks, headlines. These are headlines that have slams, reps, rips, blasts, attacks, demands, you know, and, they, and, and, and it's on all sides and they're all blasting and coming at each other and go, this is not right. Everybody's trying to cut the other person down and make them out as the bad guy. And we're the United States of America. We are not red state, blue state like this. And what are we gonna do? We are gonna destroy ourselves if we keep staying apart. If we keep staying apart, we, the power of coming together is, is essential and, and necessary, so necessary at this time. So anyway, my goal when I, and I, and I actually stopped working, I had a very finite stop date. After I had a big January speaking at national sales conferences. In February, I went on vacation to Ecuador and to Peru. And, and, um, and then on I came home and I went to Houston and did the opening keynote for the National Speakers Association sales conference. I thought that's a perfect thing to go out on. You know, it's a high. And then I came back and I had jury duty. Two weeks of jury duty. Of course, I didn't go the whole time, but I kind of had to block that schedule off to just do it. And then after that, July, March 15th, I was going to figure out how to launch this Millions in the Middle thing. And guess what happened at exactly that same time? The COVID virus was heating up. Everything was shutting down. Stay at home order came in and, and I kind of started going like this, spinning. Like, now what, now what? I mean, it was so clearly the wrong thing to do at that time when people's lives were at stake and nobody knew what was going on and everybody was um, spinning. Everybody was spinning. Um, so, so I tried launching something else to make people, it was, I, I bought a domain name called, um, I helped.us. I got a company to donate their website services to help me create a website. And it would be, um, it would be a website that was devoted to showing how people were helping with the coronavirus and all the neat things that were going on. And I got everything ready to go. And then I came to a grinding halt again, because it, some point I knew it was not the right thing for me to do. So here I am, here I am today, stuck. No, I'm, I'm meddling in the, in the question right now. My question right now is, is what can I do and how can I contribute to make a better world? And what is my job to do in the muck that's out there? Because I think we all have a job to do. And at first it looks like overwhelming and I take a look at what has to be done and, and, you know, first of all, there's, there's so much money in politics. When I learned that our, that our representatives spent at the, you know, House of Representatives and Senate spent 60% of their time fundraising as opposed to working on the issues and challenges facing our country, that really bothers me that that's happening. And then I find out that 80% of the bills that are passed are passed based on lobbying, not dealing with the issues that we agree on as a people. And then, and then I take a look at voting and I think voting, I mean, we are United States of America. We have voting rights and we want people to vote and yet there's so much being done to prohibit voting. And I take a look at, you know, the, the differential between the rich and the poor. And I think back in the eighties or, or so, CEOs of companies made 40 times what their lowest worker is. And today CEOs and high level executives make 400 times what their lowest level worker is. And I go, that's not right. That's not right. And, and, and I, so you see that I'm spinning and then comes COVID and the healthcare issues that are all associated with that. And then comes George Floyd and the racial justice issues that are there. So we're at a period of time when there's so much that is needed. And every single one of us, I believe is called to do something, some, at a local level, something at a more national level, but I think it's imperative that all of us look at ourselves and say, what can I do to help us return to the core values of our country and what's most important and what we truly believe in? For me, I, I, I think I need to take a look right now. I mean, I'm just telling you where I'm going at fair, at fair voting issues. I mean, I just, you know, with an election coming up, I want every person who, who can and should be voting, I want them to vote because that is who we are as a nation. But I think, you know, I think this is saying, who are we as a person? And who are we as a country? What do we believe in? What do we find as, you know, it's essential, but it's a call to our humanity to take a look at what are we here to do? And 
I know it starts with questions and that's why I started with questions. And the question is, what is yours to do? What is mine to do? Where, where do we fit in all of this? And, and even I'm playing mind games with myself, but I take a look at the George Floyd situation here in Minneapolis. And I don't know, I certainly don't have any answers. I can tell you, I have no answers, but I'm not sure if we're asking the right questions, if you want my thoughts on that. For example, should we eliminate the police force or not? Should we, should we cut funding for the police force or not? Now that's a yes or no question. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a yes or no question. It doesn't, you know, well, maybe we should give police officers um, training on how to be nice to, uh, you know, other people or, or the kinds of holds they can and can't do. I mean, maybe we need to be doing that. But I think that there's a bigger question, which is how do we keep our community safe and safe for everybody that's in the community? And what does safety mean? And how do we look at being safe? And what does it mean different things to different people? I can tell you that if I was a mother of a young black son right now, you'd have a whole different answer than you'd get from me speaking as Jill Conrad, who grew up in Roseville. I would have, you'd have a very different answer in terms of what safety is. Um, so I think it's a time to ask questions, to take a look at the questions we're asking and not look for simple answers. To not even look, and I spent many of years thinking it was critical to look at root cause issues, but I think if you dive into root cause issues, it gets you into a mire in terms of what you're doing wrong. But I, th I think it, the questions can be raised to, you know, like, what did the, instead of what did the police do wrong and what do we need to correct with the police, what are the root cause issues? The question is how can we focus on safety for all of the people in, in our area? So that to me is where I'm at. I am stepping into a gulp. I am um, scared in terms of what I'm doing. One of the reasons I did move downtown is because I knew this was coming. I knew I was going to be tipping into this area and it scared me for trolls than bad people out there who could come after me because they don't like me. So I moved into a building with security. Thank you for inviting me. But I have 350,000 followers. Wow, I mean, it's just incredible. So she is really the authority worldwide when it comes to sales training and, and the books. And she's always putting out great books. And I love her reason for putting in a book is, so when you write it all down, then you don't have to remember it anymore. And then That's you can- I told you, right? <laughs> yeah, and I've used that because it's like, well, I write it down, now I remember it, now I don't have to remember it. And then I can think about other stuff. It's like freeing up my mind. So um, it's, it's great. So Terry, what should we do next? Um, Jill, this was excellent. Thank you very much. I, I, I see how the spiral goes and you made it go up and that's important. <laughs> and and um, you, you've had many challenges and I really appreciate you sharing with them with us today. And I want to say that I, I want to give you a copy of our, Opt uh, our Optimus Creed Thanks. plan because many of the lines you have turned into positivity for you and your life. And it really is important, you know, to be so strong that nothing can disturb your peace of mind. You got that one going. To, protect, <laughs> to forget the mistakes of the past. And, and I appreciate sharing with those. And it, it was just wonderful. So thank you so much. And... Um, so everyone, let's give her a round of applause. Thank you very much. And we do hope that we see you again at some of our meetings. Please, uh, we'd like to have you come back more often and, and visit and be, be with us in the, as, a, as a club. Thank you.